All right, so we are officially recording, and I'm really grateful to have uh, a new guest on my show today. And I just want you to start off by um, just introducing yourself, and, and I'll have a little introduction that I put in later when I edit it. But yeah, just tell us um, who you are and maybe how you found out about um, the Winter Faith Podcast. Yeah, my name is Amethyst Rodriguez, and I teach about transformation and how to do sustainable transformation. I have a podcast called This Is Hope. And the way that we found each other, I think was just, you know, naturally podcasters discover other podcasters. I think I found you on Instagram. Uh, I really love the idea of winter faith. I love the idea of talking about the winter seasons in our faith. And uh, part of my motivation for my podcast is to discover hope in the unexpected places, people and situations in life. So I do think that there's quite an intersection there in terms of our values and what we what we find uh, important to talk about. So that's how we discovered each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I, I want you also to mention um, some of the work that you're doing in Congo right now. Okay, yeah. So most of the work that I've done in Congo is complete for me, but basically my background is uh, I started when I was about a teenager, I wanted to be a war correspondent. So I really geared my life toward writing. I've written my entire life. And around the time when I was just about to become an adult, I had had this encounter with, uh, with Jesus. And I decided that I didn't want to write about the story, but I wanted to be a part of the story. And I learned that through being a missionary, I could be a part of the story. I can be in, a part of the communities that I would write about. So I geared my life toward that. I ended up moving to Africa when I was 18 years old and I stood two years in Zambia. And then I said, did another 10 years in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is a region that has been undergoing civil war, proxy wars, and also just kind of an international uh, scramble for resources for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And um, that really took most of my life. And I did that for about yeah, 10 years, and I finished working there in 2019, but recently there has been uh, a disaster, a natural disaster, where I lived was, there was a volcano within about five miles of where I lived and where I worked, so that volcano is up within the top five most active volcanoes in the world, so we knew that it could possibly erupt, and it recently did, less than a month ago, and so that has affected a lot of people that I knew there. So that while I did not want to go down kind of the rabbit hole of like, okay, let's get back into Congo and let me continue working there. I do have this kind of, I have my values, which is that, you know, if somebody is reaching out for help, like, and you actually have a way to help, uh, you should do something. So, so I don't really work in Congo anymore, but of recently I have been helping to get some cash relief, $75 of cash to specifically the families that I've been in relationship with. So that's something that me and my, my followers have been doing together. Yeah, that's great. And we'll definitely put a link in the show notes and we'll, we'll promote that. And that's, um, that's gotta be devastating to just to endure like physically being there, but then also to be so far away from your loved ones. That's also a painful um, process. So I appreciate that work that you're promoting. And one of the things that, um, you know, that I think you had mentioned is like, man, my podcast has a lot of um, white men. Maybe we should get some different perspective, which I <laughs> completely agree with. So um, you have an article that, that you wrote um, pretty recently on your website, This is Hope, um, a year after George Floyd. Um, what, kind of, um, what kind of thoughts do you have? Obviously, we'll, we'll, you know, people can go through and, and read this, but if you kind of had a theme for a, you know, where you're at today, what would you say? Yeah, um, I think I could start out with a little bit of background, which is that I grew up in the evangelical church and uh, mm -hmm. going way back uh, recently, you know, now we have the ability to like 
trace our DNA and do all that stuff. And I knew obviously by my hair and by like certain features that I have that there's like some African there. I'm Puerto Rican. And when when you say you're Puerto Rican, that means you're a hundred percent mixed. You're mixed with European, you're mixed with the indigenous people and you're usually mixed with quite a bit of African because Mm -hmm. of the slaves that came to the Caribbean. And uh, recently I was contacted by like 50 family members through this DNA test. I have never taken it, but they took it. And there was this long lost sibling within the great of the grandparents. And um, and basically they discovered that I was one of the lineage of those long lost si- sibling. Now here's the interesting thing. Uh, they said that when I got in contact with them, started talking to them, I wanted to know what are they learning? Cause there's, partic- there's some of them that have really put a lot of time into this. And one of the things that they learned was that one, uh, that when you go back with our family history, it doesn't go very far back for two reasons, which is one, on that side of my family, my great grandfather was African. And back in that time, they were considered property. So therefore there wasn't any birth certificates that went back before that. And then the second thing is that in the island of Puerto Rico, when it was colonized, you had the local indigenous religions, you had the Catholic religion that was colonized by Spain. And then also you have these Pentecostals and the Pentecostal church was not really the official established church that went along with the government. My family was among the Pentecostals. So the way you would record birth certificates is if that you were through the Catholic church and my family that, that was a part of the church was a part of the Pentecostal church. So, uh, so our family history doesn't go that far back because we were among the minority religions and obviously also the minority races. So I say all that to say, uh, I literally in my blood, you know, come out of the evangelical faith in terms of my culture, but then Mm -hmm. also growing up the kind of my story is I, my family moved, I'm originally from New York city and my family moved to a rural town in Florida, specifically me and my mom and Puerto Ricans families, everything. So she wanted to find family for me and she knew that there was the church. So she stuck me in the church and it was again, very white, very rural and said, this is your family. And that has been a lot of my foundation and my formation. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, I think in, I think that's, they were the ones who influenced me to, uh, to really go into missions, uh, who taught me uh, in some way that the world is bigger than my backyard. There's a lot of beautiful things that I have to thank my old church for, but also now going down the rabbit hole of three or 10, 12 years in ministry. And for the most part, not so much doing it with anything else except for the white evangelical church and being kind of the, the one of the few minorities that were in leadership, um, and at least in the spheres that I was in, I do realize, uh, a few years later now in my 30s, the areas where I have not had time to grieve, the areas that I think I had to to hide or the areas of my own ethnic identity that I did not fully recognize because uh, a lot, a large part of being a missionary is raising support and a large part of raising support and fundraising uh, is about uh, creating trust with the people, make, feel it, making other people feel like you're a trustworthy person and making them feel safe. And there are subjects that are within the church uh, that are not within church, church or right now subjects that we're talking around that don't make people feel safe. And they were always, always topics that I cared about. But as a missionary, I never brought them up because again, it was the establishment of that trust and uh, just even with the last year, we've seen that there's just, there's such a, uh, like there's this line that gets drawn in the sand sometimes where it's them or us or something like that. And mm. I just have never been allowed to go there or maybe allowed myself to. And with the dre- death of jo- George Floyd, Floyd, the murder of Joyce, George, George Floyd, I would actually say, um, I think that was when I came to a point where I realized, okay, this is, there's two sides of history and I just don't wanna be on the wrong side. But also there is kind of like a deeper story, which was that when I came back from Africa and I kind of finished working uh, in ministry in 2019, 
I came back because of the crisis of going through a divorce. That's what brought me back. And part of letting go of being in the Congo for 10 years was was also kind of letting go of the marriage, letting go of the Congo, letting go of everything. It was kind of like a restart button. And when I hit that restart button, it was very difficult to think about how I, how can I hold space for this life I used to have and this new life that I'm starting, new marriage, new job, new town, new everything. And the only way I knew how to handle that was to to just pretend like the other things didn't happen. So I would just go and I would meet new people in the city that I live in. I currently live in Orlando. And I would honestly act like I'd never lived anywhere. I would not tell them anything about my background. And when this happened with George Floyd, I, it was the, it, I had done that for about a year or so. And then when that happened, it was the first time where I couldn't speak about why I felt the way I felt without reaching back into my history. Mm. And I really believe that for me, um, and it was really hard because I remember when it was all going on, I was feeling some very strong emotions inside of me. And I felt like there was just so much I had, but at the same time, um, I just didn't know how to, I didn't know how to reach back. And there finally came a moment where I just told I, I kind of just got on my knees in my, my bedroom and I just cried and I began to, I feel like that was the beginning of just grief upon grief of every, every um, implicit and explicit racist thing I've ever heard in my, in my time, especially in the church Mm -hmm. that I never said anything back about Uh, every time that I found myself being the inner racist and bigot like it was just this moment where everything I began to start grieving it and I told my husband we need to find a cardboard and and the uh, for us the protests that were going on they were literally going on right south outside of our apartment like Mm. it was right outside so when they started passing by I just told my husband we need to grab cardboard we need to like put something on it and we need to get out there and we got out there and we got you know tear gassed and everything (laughs) along with everybody Mm. else but to me, that was that was uh, that was something very special to me because I think it was my personal revival. Because when I closed the book of doing ministry, closed the book of the marriage, and closed the book of all the relationships really that were associated with that, um, I like I think a part of me kind of died. And mm-hmm. when I chose to grab that cardboard and I chose to put myself on a Facebook live and start marching out there and start mm-hmm. sharing what, how I felt about where I, where I lie within this, this spectrum and still call myself the da- a daughter of the evangelical church, mm-hmm. that was kind of a revival. That was a revival of Amethyst. Wow. I mean, that's a powerful story. And I just, you know, I, I'm thinking about like where, you know, where, where do you go where you have this relationship where you appreciate your past life, but you yet grieve your past life, you appreciate who you are and who raised you and and all the good things that you're so, you know, I guess as I'm in my thirties too, it's like, I do, I think about that for, you know, myself too. There's certain things that I've, you know, kind of changed, definitely changed on. And so when I think about this idea like of winter faith, it seems like this would be kind of like you're in that winter faith moment right now. Do you, do you feel that like tension and how would you talk about that? Describe that. Yes. I, I think I have been in a winter faith moment. I'm still, I'm still in it. And I think there there's a lot of grief and of course the grief cycle part of that grief cycle is anger and sure uh I think something that's very important to me I've been kind of trying to discover it is that you know how does one hold space for anger how does a community of people hold space for anger because what I've realized is that the communities that I grew up in there is no space for it and um and I'm realizing hey I have that But on the other end, actually, I'm aware, I'm aware of it. And I feel like it's okay. It's okay to have that. 
But on the other hand, as a, I would consider myself in my own way, a contemporary leader of, of, uh, in my small sphere. So mm-hmm. as a contemporary leader, how do I hold space for this anger? But then I also understand that um, actually it was a Congolese, uh, a Congolese mentor of mine that told me, whatever it is that you feel so strongly to judge, you will find that that's inside of you. So mm-hmm. um, while I'm also holding space for the anger and allowing that to, to happen, um, and part of the way I've actually done that is actually by allowing myself to say, I want to step out of certain relationships. I want to step out of certain circles, not because of bitterness or unforgiveness, but because I need to hold space for that. And there will be a time and it'll be on my terms. And a lot of ways as a missionary, most of my life, I feel like I've always gone to people on their terms. So I've been about their terms. It's a time where I'm allowed to re-enter certain relationships and certain conversations, certain circles on my terms. So that's my way of holding space for the anger. But now addressing this thing, which is that, hey, if I feel so deeply about this, perhaps there's something in me. And I think um, something I've really had to navigate through is what, you know, I, I do realize that there is a lot of ignorance um, inside of the, uh, the circles that I come from. You know, it's you know, you, you, you might even understand it. Like, you know, you can try to sympathize or you can try to understand what, how someone feels, but it's like, if you only know two black people, or maybe there are some people who who know literally none, you know, I remember I talked to a friend once and she was like, uh, you know, I dated a black guy once (laughs) just because she dated a black guy once and literally nothing she said to me, nothing she said to me, humanized this black man about Mm. like this person she dated. But so I had to ask myself, where and what group of people am I that ignorant about? And as a minority, I have to be honest with myself. We as Puerto Ricans, we have not been real good about the LGBTQ plus community. Like we just, when it comes to that, we might be super aware of the racial dynamics. But when it comes to that kind of stuff, LGBTQ plus, I mean, I've just heard it all. I've heard it up and down, um, every bad thing. And so... I had to realize um, in in kind of working through this, I'm like, okay, where am I, I where my friends are, some of my friends and their ignorance, mm-hmm. where, where's my place of ignorance? And I realized my place of ignorance is actually in that community mm-hmm. that I, I, at the time when I realized that I was like, I have like no friends who come from that community. I could say I knew this person, I knew this person, but I have no friends. Mm-hmm. And since then, I think my way of trying to empathize with the people I'm angry with is to also identify as them only for a different community and think about how am I going to work through this um, with that community? Um, and that's kind of, it's a complex answer, but. <laughs> no, but I mean, that takes great humility to kind of turn back, like I'm angry at this group because of a lack of ignorance. Now I'm going to turn it on myself. That takes a lot of humility to do that. And that's just something like just hearing it now, you say that it makes me think, okay, how can I do that in in my life also? Um, And also just this idea of going back a little bit about like you suffered, you write that you suffered a lot of death in the years leading up to George Floyd's own murder, like a marriage, a career, a home, a community. And you talk about you know, you went this route of like, I had to learn how to like trust myself again. And I think part of what you're saying is like, do I trust myself? Like I'm angry at this, um, um, this group of people for their lack of ignorance. Well, how can I turn that on myself? Like, do I really trust myself? And that's really, I mean, that's an interesting question. Again, when I look back at my life, okay, um, you know, I'm going to talk about winter faith and like questioning God and questioning my views about God and my own pain and and suffering. But then I look at pain and suffering of others and mine feels so small and and so little. And then it's like, do I actually have faith or am I just kind of promoting this idea? Um, I don't know. I don't know really what the question is in there, but I just think that takes a lot of humility um, in what you just said. And do you have, you know, we're talking about like a year later, do you have um, different thoughts or, or, or um, has anything changed in the last year um, since the murder of George Floyd for you? More hopeful, less hopeful? I'm curious about that. 
Um, when it comes to the politics of it all, that's I'm I, I will always say that I have hope. Obviously, Florida, Florida yesterday, we just banned critical race theory inside of our classrooms, which I am not a big fan of. I'm not a big fan of them doing that. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of the politics of it all, we are in the thick of it. And I think really there's true, I can say that I really believe that there's a lot of people who feel like they're, I, they're losing a battle and they are just getting extremely nasty about it. And, yeah. and in the end, I just, I kind of refuse to give that any too much time just because it's like, it's a losing battle. You guys are just trying to like get anything that you can, but ultimately the nation is changing and there's nothing that you can do it. So that's one side. Mm -hmm. On the mm -hmm. other end, um, I think more importantly, there's the relationships, there's the personal thing, because on a vast kind of political propaganda one way or the other, there's, there's always sweeping statements and there's always a lot of gray in between those sweeping black and white statements. And I think the gray comes when we actually do life. And I think for me, again, it was a revival because I had to pick up my past. Um, I couldn't, I can't really explain how I feel about Black Lives Matters without explaining that, hey, I lived in t 10 years in the Congo. They're like on the bottom of the food chain when it comes to like this thing called capitalism. Like mm -hmm. you, you, you and I, we're talking on a computer, you know, we both have cell phones and these, these things are literally, there's pieces of the Congo in it. The raw material that goes into creating these things come from the Congolese. And if, and that makes no one upset. That makes no one upset. And that in itself should tell us that, hey, there is very much, uh, not just in the United States, but across the world, there are people on the bottom of the food chain. And more, more often than not, it's usually the black and brown people, the darker your skin, the lower you are. And if we can't recognize that, then we, we are not aware. There's some, there's some critical consciousness that we have not arrived at. And, mm -hmm. and I think that um, for me, I have, I have to like really reach back there. And so for me, I, that, that's where I've, what's changed was that I thought, okay, I, if I'm going to truly continue to live out my values, I need to speak about what I've seen and why I feel this way. And mm -hmm. I need to do it within the circles that I'm in, if, if there's space for it. And if there's not space for it, and this is going back to what you said about trusting yourself, I think yeah. as a woman, and I'm sure this has been discussed because there's been some wonderful women uh, interviewed on this podcast, I think in the faith, sometimes we're taught not to trust ourselves. I think right. even the origin story of, of, our, of our faith, sometimes we say, you know, we were essentially bad. We, we totally cancel out that God, that we were created in the image of God and that was good. Like, right. but we say that we're essentially bad and that Christ needed to come to redeem. And I think that that in itself kind of, that's like a foundation that goes off of the idea that we can't trust our inner, our, our authentic selves. And uh, and I think it even goes deeper for a woman, oftentimes being taught that you need a covering all you need the covering and that, you know, you're not able to, to do things without a certain amount of covering over you. And, uh, and I do believe in like, that there is blessing and there's beauty, beauty in covering, but I do think that there is a lot of teaching that makes us even question ourselves more. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I think choosing to to make the decision, hey, I'm gonna address this. It might be ugly. And I think I will lose people along the way. I have lost people. Um, definitely, I think you mentioned about death. I mean, I lead, letting go of the Congo and, and, and all the fallout that comes from a divorce. It, mm. I mean, especially when your, your marriage is kind of the branding of the ministry, a lot of missionaries, you know, they, they send this family. So suddenly what happens when it's like that family is no more. Um, you know, so it's kind of like the fallout of, of everything. There's been a lot of death, but then also in this kind of rebirth or re um, revival of myself, uh, I don't know that it's, I don't know that everybody that I had maybe called my closest friend, I don't know that they're having that. And so naturally there's just a divide that happens where, you know, our values are essentially different. 
um, what I'm talking about, what matters to me is something that is essentially the opposite of what matters to you. And so naturally there's, there's some fallout from that. And I think trusting yourself and uh, trusting God as well is knowing that for, if you are truly following him and this God is beside us, God is behind us and God is in front of us. So he's ahead of us. So he knows what's up ahead, but it's also trusting that whatever you leave behind, there's always going to be something better in the future. And so I think it's been trusting and knowing that my hunger to see what God will do if I'm honest, really honest about where, I, where the Holy Spirit is taking me, um, is, is much, it's much bigger glory than, than the latter glory. Well, it's got to feel, and I've experienced this in my own life, it feels a lot better to be your full self. Even if you're losing friends along the way and you're losing your life in, along the way, does it feel better to be your full self today? Or do you want to like go back? What? Yeah, I'm. It, it's definitely, it feels better to be honest with yourself. But yeah. I don't think the human body is designed to, to not be honest. You know, I think that when we're not honest with ourselves, the truth comes out sideways. It'll start mm -hmm. coming out and, you know, manipulation. For me, I have like, I would have like these bursts of anger when I knew mm -hmm. like some things weren't right and I wasn't able to express it and have the words. So it just came out sideways. Um, so I think it's true. I think that's really the truth. I've got a question for you yeah. I would like to, um, to hear from you as someone who is from Kenosha and mm -hmm. Um, I, I've been in Wisconsin a lot. I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin. I really? I preached at a church in, in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin as well. No I won't kidding. Say, I won't say the name, but I did preach at a church there. Wow. And, um, but uh, I would mm -hmm. love to know, so I'm aware of kind of like the politics of the area and, you know, mm -hmm. it's an apple pie eating area, let's put it that way. And sure. um, uh, yeah, I would love to know what, what, how are you feeling? How have you been navigating some of this? Well, you know, I think that I'm grateful for, you know, like the communities and the people that, that raised me. I think I grew up with the idea of kind of like racism is dead. We're past that. We're over that. It doesn't happen that much. And then to see that come out in such a public, you know, national, maybe global way in the city that I was born was pretty disheartening. Um, I think it was sad to see like the true, you know, we were just talking about the true self. Like, I think it was kind of showing the nature of the true community there that there is a lot of um, repressed, I don't, I don't know if this is the right, like repressed racism or just complete um, ig ig ignoring of it. Like, and that is really disheartening. Um, I think that I did um, a Facebook live video just talking about it after the event. And that was something that for me, I don't speak about racism a lot. And I would say the past year, I've talked about it more than I ever have. Um, when I worked and went to a seminary in Memphis, Tennessee, was the first time that I think I addressed some of my own like white privilege and some of my own um, like ignorance about the issue or ignoring of the issue of race. And in, in Memphis, I was really fortunate to work with um, black pastors who taught me a lot and I'm really grateful for that experience. And so, yeah, I think I would, I've been kind of like discouraged. I think that I was feeling on one hand, like not surprised um, that um, there was such a division in the city. I mean, literally you had I think the same day, Biden and Trump both speaking in Kenosha the same day. And to see the different crowds of people, the different things, it's um, in some ways it's like, I know it's a comp, it's complex, but it's in some ways it was like simple. It was just like, look at this divide. This is very easy to see. And it's very discouraging because we can't, I, I feel like we don't have any handle on what is, we can't agree on, on truth. 
we can't agree. Like I use the example of like, you go to the hospital and your arm's broken and we have two parties who go to the hospital and one says the arm's broken. One says, no, it's not like, where do you go? Where do you go? If, if, if one person says the arm's not even broken, like how (laughs) using that metaphor, what is the cure? What is the surgery? What is the medicine? I don't know. And so I've been pretty discouraged. And then obviously to have, um, you know, just to have the backlash of um, the election and the news cycle and the other um, continue racist acts that continue. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty discouraged and just kind of wonder, you know, wondering out loud and processing with people that I think have deeper experiences and hopefully more wisdom to me to be like, okay, there is hope. This is hope is literally the name of yours and uh, of your podcast. And I'm like, yeah. And I've even had some critique, like your podcast, like, do you, um, there's nothing about hope in, in the description or something that I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with that. (laughs) Like, I feel like I'm honestly wrestling with it. I want it to be honest and real. So that's a little bit of where, yeah, where I'm at. Yeah. And just grateful to have a, you know, have a platform to talk to people. Really grateful for that as I process things. Right. I would definitely say that the hope of all of it is, um, is the fact that we, when you see a problem, you can then start to address it. And this mm. is obviously uh, your, your podcast art. It has a tree on it. And so, yeah. you know, this is a tree that has the roots go so deep and it goes into so many areas. And I think that in one way that a person I, there's a lot of ways, but one way that an individual, wherever they are, if they're listening, whether you're in the healthcare industry, whether you are in the the education, uh, for me, I come from the nonprofit humanitarian faith-based organization work Mm -hmm. because this thing called prejudice and race, racism, and, and really also I can add patriarchy to that as well. Some of these systems go so deep, you will be able to find them in any industry that you're in. And I think it's very important that uh, because colonization, it's, it had, it's, a, it's essentially associated with colonization. It was a, some of these things have to do with, you know, the colonization of the Americas, the colonization mm-hmm. of the world. And I think if we are, if we take the time uh, to understand where did the systems in whatever work that we're doing, we can't understand it all. Like I'm not in healthcare. My I have friends in healthcare, they can get into that, but you take it in small bites. You understand where are the roots of this. For me, like I said, nonprofit humanitarian, there are some really nasty roots in, mm-hmm. in the philanthropic idea of philanthropy that came out. It's very, there, are, there was a lot of colonialism that was like, okay, let's do paternalism. Let's pretend like we're the father that's, you know, basically taking care of the children. And these are mm-hmm. adults, you know, these are peoples, these are nations, and they're kind of looking at it paternalistically. And so um, a lot of my podcasts where I'm kind of going with my podcast is that I, I would like to actually go deep and kind of uproot some of the things that we do in philanthropy today that have its roots inside of colonialism. So we can kind of decolonize this industry and in the process kind of decolonize our minds because it's mm-hmm. inside of you, it's inside, it's inside of me. Um, and I think that's where the hope is, is that when you have that light bulb that goes off and you realize, ah, oh, I never thought of it that way. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't even know this. Those are the hope moments. And, and, I, and you talk a lot about grief. I love yeah. that about grief yeah. and that there's that hope because there is no, there's no healing without grief. <laughs> right. Well, and there's no, I mean, there's no grief without love. Um, one of the things that's like grief is love. Um, when we say like, oh, I'm grieving really hard or I'm gr- like, I'm still in this grief. It's like, well, that's because the, the love, you know, just about the, the tree and the roots, like your love is so deep and so rooted. That's why we feel, that's why we feel that. And I spent two years as a hospital chaplain. And so I was dealing with grief and death every single day. And it made me appreciate life a lot more. And I think that's where I also find hope is like, we're, you know, we're still, I'm still alive. And that is a reason to be hopeful. And, um, 
yeah, I'm really grateful for each day I have. And as I think about like my own, um, my own work, which is in like education and, and my wife is in education, like those, there's some deep, some systemic roots of, of racism. And it is hopeful to try to dive into that. I like what you said. It's so deep. It impacts all like everything, um, you know? And so, yeah, I think there is a lot of hope that I'm working with people that also, I think really care about addressing some of these topics. And I think that God really cares. Like, I feel like God has been talking about, you know, if I come down, it's about pride and it's about power. That's really what we're addressing, pride and power. And maybe you could just say it's about power that like, those are things very basic to the, to the Bible and to who God is a God who liberated the people in Exodus. Um, a God who describes, um, salvation as freedom, um, and liberation. Um, and so those things also, I think, keep me, keep me hopeful and, and keep me going. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of where we can have one or two questions, but, um, we'll start with this. What, what do you think marriage has taught you about God? Oh man. Um, well, I think that, I don't even know if this is an answer to your question, but I think, right. I, I think, I think I can actually go the opposite. And again, it's again, leaning into the hope and the, the unexpected, but which, what it, I think the bigger question is what do, what do I think divorce has taught me? About? Okay. Yeah. Go with that. <laughs> go with that. Um, I think that there's an, there's a poet and he says, we are built of those, we are built of those, or we are made of all those who built and have broken us. And I, and I really love that, that saying, it was Atticus, he's a contemporary poet of today. Um, but I really love that saying because as I have gone through marriage, I was married for 10 years and then I was divorced and, mm -hmm. and then I got remarried uh, about a year ago. So uh, I've actually spent most of my life being married. My adult life, I was married pretty early and, and I, didn't, I wasn't single that long after. Um, but I think what I've learned is that we, when we leave a relationship, whether it be because of something like, it doesn't really matter whose fault it is. In the moment it does, because there are sides that are taken and you just don't like losing people. So you feel like you need to, you feel like you need to explain why, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. But in, in the all in all, most people don't even remember why, except for you. And you, um, I think it's very important to recognize the parts that we take of, of those people with, with us. Um, mm. I think that divorce is like death. The only difference is that the person is still living. Mm. And, and I think what God has really taught me is that um, everything that happens to me, like a lot of times it's the things that separate relationships are things like a broke, some type of breach of trust. And oftentimes that's what makes a relationship irreconcilable, um, marriage or friends or family, whatever it is, it's the breach of often done through betrayal. And I think what I have learned through all of this, and I can apply it to marriage, divorce, or anything in life, which is, um, the end to my relationship, there was like some massive betrayals that happened. I could say that he felt betrayed by me and I felt betrayed by him. So we, there's two sides of the story and there always will be. But I feel that as I go through my timeline of everything that happened, I think back to the times that I was inauthentic when I said mm -hmm. yes to something or I said something was okay when it was really not starting with even in my time of kind of masking my own ethnic identity, my maybe political mm. beliefs in front of people, starting even from that time. And I realized that, you know, someone doesn't just take an airplane and go to a different continent, like, and never say goodbye 
that kind of betrayal doesn't happen just out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It starts with small betrayals that come along the way. And most of the time, it's not even the betrayal that the person did to you. It's where you betrayed yourself because you didn't say, hey, this is not working for me. This is not okay. And I think that what marriage has taught me or any type of covenant relationship as well, because I think beyond even marriage, there are covenant relationships we have in our lives. We have to be, we can't confuse like, we can't confuse the fact that things are peaceful with, uh, what's how, how should I say it? Sometimes we think everything's okay because there's no fighting happening. Mm -hmm. We have to actually realize that sometimes conflict is actually an attempt. It's our way of trying to pursue love. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's what, um, what marriage and divorce has taught me is like, hey, uh, we need to lean into the stuff that's the tiny little inklings. Like, it's not always okay to be that person who's like, I'm just down with anything. I'm just cool. I'm easygoing. Everybody wants to be that person. And it's cool if you are on certain subjects that really don't matter to you. But if you're making it out like, oh, I'm easygoing when you're really not, you should probably be saying that. You have to know your boundaries um, because boundaries are love. You have kids and we know mm -hmm. that it's an act of love to actually put those boundaries down. They feel more loved. And the truth is, is that we're just big, big children and big body. And so right. it's the same thing when we get married that we need to actually have those boundaries for ourselves and let our, our, our friends, our best friends and our, our spouses know that if not over time, you betray yourself. Yeah. You can point the finger and say, Oh, this person betrayed you. But the truth is, is like, well, they were taken after what you did to yourself. You weren't being mm -hmm. honest. And so I think right. that's what, I, that's what um, I feel like I've learned from marriage and, and being married again. I don't think it's all that different. When I look back, I'm like, you know, this is in the sense of like th the same rule applies. I just, I think the only difference is now I'm able to know what my boundaries are, what my preferences are. Sometimes they're preferential and that's okay. Um, and to just communicate it in a healthy way. And if I'm not communicating it in a healthy way, go find a counselor, go find someone who will help me put those tools in my tool belt so that I can have those tools to communicate it. So it's fair for the other person. And also it's fulfilling for me. Yeah, and what I hear is like, anytime we're hiding something, we're not being true to ourselves and it's actually hurting ourselves. And then it hurts the others around us, obviously. Mm -hmm. But- yeah, anytime we're, you know, like, I, I feel like I've, at times in my life, like, lived, like, a double life where I'm saying one thing and acting like another, and that, you know, whether I'm in seminary or preaching at a church, like, to have that tension where you're hiding is such this, like, awful feeling, and we have this lie that it doesn't affect everybody else. Oh, it's just me and my stuff, but all that, you know, I think what I hear you saying, it's like it, it all affects ourself and everybody else. Um, and it's so much better when we live into that conflict and that uncomfortableness. Like when you're leaning into the uncomfortable, whether it's theologically or in a relationship or whatever, anytime you're leaning into the uncomfortable, it's probably not a bad thing. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I agree with you on that. It's, yeah. we don't live in a vacuum. So like as much as we might think that we, we do, or we might feel like our little selves, you know, but we're not, we're, we're a part of a greater whole. And um, that's something that we've forgotten about. When we read the Bible, we read it like individuals. We, when, mm -hmm. when those letters were written to like groups of people. Right. So uh, like, and sometimes we read it as like, you know, for instance, like in our culture, we say, you know, let's take Christ as my personal Lord and savior. Mm -hmm. and that's something I learned what, from being overseas for so long. Other people don't, that's, that's an American idea. Like my personal sure. Lord and savior. No, he's ours. There's right. other, um, there's other cultures. They don't really even use the I and me like that. Those pronouns are not even very much used. It's always we and us, even when mm. they're talking about themselves. And I think sometimes our individualism here can get in the way of our, our view of God, you know, Jesus is Jesus is Jesus. And we can say, oh, Jesus is the answer, but it can be actually quite ingenuine because when someone's idea of Jesus, it's like what you're talking about, you know, the arm is broken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there are different, it can be a little ingenuine sometimes um, when 
when we're saying Jesus is the answer, but we have different people who have an idea of what their Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And, and um, again, we want to make it black and white. Oh, well, Jesus is this and that, but it is a little gray. Once you add culture to it, once you add history, once you add context, I've learned that the Congolese Jesus is a lot different than the American Jesus. Is one mm. bad and the other uh, good? No, there's a lot of gray. There's good and bad in both. And so um, I think it is a very, it, it is a very fantastical uh, way of thinking to think that there's this easy good and bad, uh, you know, like this force of good and bad. It's like the Marvel movies. That's why, you know, <laughs> that that's a Marvel movie. It stays in the Marvel movies, you know, but it for us, in real life and in, in this life that we live, we do have to know that there's a lot of shades of gray and we have to navigate that and, um, and trust what our formation gave us. What do you think is one difference between, like you mentioned the American Jesus compared to how Jesus is viewed in Congo, where just the individualism that we have, or is there another thing you were thinking of? Um, let's see. I want to I want to answer, and I, I I'm always real careful and answer on behalf of the Congolese. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. I don't want uh, you to be like you're speaking for all. Yeah, um, I'll, for I'll, all I'll, people. But I'm just curious, what you, maybe in that moment, what was one of the things you were thinking of? I will say this: I have learned that we value in the United States leaders who are a little bit more pushy, who are a little bit more like, you know, even, even persuasive or yeah, like just evangelism or, or who are a little bit more domineering in their okay. and in their sure. characteristics. And I'm not, this is not a political thing. I'm not trying to like throw this at, no, this is just actually just our American ideology. When we are in a room and there's like maybe a meeting going on and there's a person who's talking a lot mm -hmm. um, and they seem to know what they're talking about, we will be like, well, that's a natural leader. And okay. in the Congolese culture, when there is a leader talk, there's a person talking a lot, there's actually a Swahili, a Swahili saying, I speak Swahili. And one of it says, when there's many ideas, wisdom runs away. Hmm. And so, and so it's, so even just that I think can be something that shapes what we see Jesus as. Um, because I mean, when I, what I learned there was a lot of times the leader in the room is the last to speak most of the time. And, uh, and I remember I, I got, oh man, I, I got totally bamboozled by people with this because it was like my American, you know, bulldoze mentality, you know, I'd go into a meeting and I thought because I heard three or four people say their opinion, okay, well now I can share mine. But mm -hmm. then I would walk out of the room and then like my co-leaders will look at me and be like, you didn't let everyone speak. Like, and I was like, well, mm. no one else was speaking up. Like there was this long pause and so on. They're like, yeah, but you're the most, like we're the most powerful people in the room. So the moment we say something, it's as if it's already done. We have to, even if you have something in your mind, you have to let every voice be heard. Wow. And then it, no matter how long it takes. And I, I think that that's um, a really cool side of, of the culture that really, when I think about it, I'm like, you know, Jesus wasn't in a hurry for anything, so. Right, right, yeah, no, we want to be efficient, we want to be, which usually means fast and loud and quick, and I mean, we don't, I, I would say, like, we don't want to hear everybody's voice, we just want to hear the best voice, where, um, be, and as if there is <laughs> the best voice, it's kind of an arrogant thought to begin with, um, but that's, that's pretty fascinating. And you're talking about like in a kind of like a business meeting context, not just in like a, a church context. Yeah, this was in a, in a business meeting and um, in a local gathering where there's, you know, revered leaders, they call them the barazas. Usually women aren't allowed, not in the ones that I was in, but, okay. but the idea, um, you know, the traditional indigenous way of doing things. One other thing I'll mention that I think you'll find very interesting and maybe the listeners would be, mm -hmm. I, I learned that the North American culture, we have this really, we're so uncomfortable with silence in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like for, for instance, if we were even in our podcast, if we had a moment where we, we went a good 10 seconds and no one spoke, it would make, it would probably make you feel really uneasy. 
And, right, right. And in, in that culture, they expect that pause to be there. They, they, they revere that, that long pauses of silence. And then after that, someone else speaks. And many times in our culture, we feel like we need to fill that silence and we'll fill it with just riff rap, like garbage. Sometimes we're just yeah. kind of, we're just trying to fill it. Whereas for them, they are literally waiting for that pause to happen so everyone can breathe and think about what was just said. And then after that, someone else continues the conversation. And so I think that that pause, it's like the sela. I think that it's like a sela is, is what mm -hmm. we think of. And it's very, it, it's a beautiful thing. And it's something that I kind of recognized within myself that while I was there was that, hey, like that's a, that's actually a really beautiful part of the culture. Yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah, I'm definitely uncomfortable with with silence. And a lot of times even, you know, I'm like editing out silence as I'm doing the podcast because it's like, oh, I, that, you know, I don't want somebody to, I don't know what I think. Like, I don't want them to fast forward or I don't, you know, we have all these resources. We could probably deal with 10 seconds of silence. It'd probably be okay. But um, <laughs> that that is that is really beautiful. That's probably something I can take away and apply to my marriage to stop and listen and be silent probably a good thing so well thanks so much for taking time today and this has been a great conversation i really appreciate it yeah i appreciate it too thank you so much well how do you